So heads up then is that I'm going to record today's meeting. We have a lot to cover and it um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of information here that I think we want to capture for everyone uh, so that they can uh, take advantage of it, um, whether they're able to join us today or, or not. Again, thank everyone for it, uh, 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 this postponed start for today's meeting versus our regular 10 o'clock time. Um, I had a conflict uh, that uh, couldn't be avoided and it um, and so it uh, so we're kicking off here a little bit later. So again, with uh, a key focus of today's discussion, of course, is going to be our July 24th um, garden tour. We'll, we'll have time in the agenda to talk more about that as we get there. Um, but at, uh, but Terry did send along this brand new poster that WSU has released relative to um, uh, th that will be displayed at each of the gardens. And um, as Terry and I were chatting via email earlier today, we applaud the phrasing of this poster in that it's putting the responsibility onto the individual, right, as to whether they wear a mask or not. Um, by entering this facility without a mask, you're representing yourself as being fully vaccinated. So mm -hmm. it, it um, you know, it, uh, as you said, Terry, you know, we don't have to be the mask police. Yeah. At any rate, um, so we're here today. Um, we've got a, a, a number of just uh, pro forma updates. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about relative to the, um, uh, the garden tour that's coming up on the 24th. And that it, uh, Pat Munts will be joining us here um, as a, about midway through the hour to talk about her book, um, you know, at, uh, Gardening in the Pacific Northwest. So at, uh, again, this is one of the great advantages of meetings by Zoom is that you can tap into expertise that is sitting in Spokane <laughs> and uh, have her share with us today. So it's great to be able to have access to that technology, and that uh, and that uh, and 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 she is an author. Let's kick off with some uh, birthdays here for July. Um, it's a busy month, you know. Shout out to Mike. Your birthday's coming up here. Aaron's not on the call just yet. Uh, John, I, he's not able to join us here this morning. Uh, Mary Jean Grimes shares her birthday with the Garden Tour on the twenty fourth. Um, so happy birthday to all um that um that have their birthdays here in july and again reminder if you, indeed you know that you have a birthday in july or any of these months and you've not given that information over to alina uh to put into the roster well we're not going to find out about it so we won't be able to wish you a happy birthday if you don't tell us but again happy birthday to all hey july to do's from osu this is always interesting, right? You know, when you start talking about, you know, what uh, Oregon State thinks are the to do's vis a vis our coastal environment up in uh, Washington. Uh, there really are some subtle differences here. Um, what is interesting to note that this is the time to start thinking about fall planting. And it just, it's bizarre, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the triple digit days to start thinking about fall planting. Um, but it, um, it certainly isn't, um, it certainly isn't far away. Um, uh, it's interesting that, uh, Oregon coast, the July to do's here, it says first plantings of Chinese cabbage and kohlrabi and rutabagas. Well, we just harvested and had a root uh, kohlrabi last evening for dinner. And it, uh, so it just, it, uh, it's it, again, one of these great differences about Oregon coast is thinking about first plantings and we're thinking about second plantings already as having, having already harvested. A very healthy kohlrabi. So um, uh, maintenance, best time to water, early morning. Obviously the recommendation, and this is so key, right, for some people who are new to gardening, right? Um, water the toes, not the nose, right? Don't water the foliage, especially during, I don't, I, I it, you know, we probably can spend another half hour talking about how many of our plants were scorched, you know, over the past couple of weeks with that intense sun um, and of course, it's just, uh, you know, we'll have to see what, um, you know, what transpires out of that. Um, you'll notice that um, uh, Rachel Ghana, uh, one of our master gardeners here in Pacific County, actually had a piece in our local paper um, speaking to the scorching and speaking specifically to the fact that don't prune those leaves off yet. You know, those leaves, even though many of them are dead or dying, provide some shade and will help the remaining foliage of the plant survive the weeks ahead of very, very dry weather that we still, that we still know we have to expect. 
And of course, with respect to lawn clippings and garden plant trimmings, this composting recommendation here is key. You'll see on the slide here, don't compost, you know, if this, uh, if the lawn's been treated, you know, with the super, uh, the super duper chemicals and uh, don't compost disease plants unless you've got a, unless you're confident that you've got a hot compost going. Uh, pest monitoring, man, there's all kinds of, them, right. You know, at uh, tomatoes, you know, at the, the blueberries netting, um, uh, root weevils on the roadies, um, spider mites, um, cutworms. Anybody out there have any unique pests that they're of particular concern about this year? Anybody, anything, anything interesting, particularly pesty? Just the normal? <laughs> uh, Kelly? I've noticed a, a huge increase in the number of leaf hoppers, whose species I haven't determined, on ferns. Ferns, you know, usually are pretty uh, problem free, but they are being being somewhat damaged by the the leaf hopper. Interesting. And so you definitely know it's a leaf hopper as opposed to a yeah. mite or something else. Okay, but we just don't know yeah. the particular species. No, I don't know. I should find out. But it's interesting. It's leaving little yellow spots on the on the foliage. If you recall, one of our earlier speakers, I don't know if it was Doug Collins or somebody earlier in the, a few months ago, was very much concerned about fern dyed at dieback. Yeah. Yeah. They, I think they still do not know exactly what's going on. The huge patches of sword fern are just dying off, you know, like somebody came in and says, okay, your time is up, die now. But, but why? Why? So at any rate, we move into, um, um, you know, other uh, nurturing potatoes, um, rhubarb, asparagus, weed and fertilize, compost, um, your, uh, your rhubarb. Um, I will tell you, though, that I was successful in killing rhubarb by over mulching. So at, uh, I, I, I put that caveat out there that, that uh, rhubarb can be killed. And I'm, at, uh, I'm here to testify how to do it. Um, Staking of tall flowering plants, especially appropriate, you know, in the windy conditions right here at the coast. Um, definitely time uh, to be thinking about that. And then, of course, this was, a, this was something that we popped up the last time we did this, this lily leaf beetle. And this was a special concern at the, at, uh, this is back in 2019. Um, and I actually kept the, it was the last time we actually had a meeting in which we actually shared this slide. I actually, so I decided to redo this slide for 2021. I'm curious, has anyone seen uh, this nasty little beetle? It looks like it's a very pretty, it's, it, would, it would certainly seem like you're seeing it, you know, that bright red, if it's out there. <laughs> Um, I, I lived with these in uh, back east. They're very prolific in Massachusetts, and they are just death on all the lily family. Um, not always easy to see because they put their frass on their backs as camouflage. Oh, how clever. <laughs> yeah, very clever. <laughs> not fun to handle, but um, I have not seen any. I keep wondering if the Lily Lane Nursery over near the Westport Winery has had them. I, I ask them every year if they have. I haven't asked this year. Very interesting. So quick reminder then for everyone, especially the, um, our, 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 our interns now and, uh, new to the program, you know, that uh, we gather here today as a foundation, which is separate from the program. The WSU program, of course, is what we all sign up for to be as, as master gardeners. And we adhere to the precepts of that program that is indeed unique and different from our activities to, as a foundation. And as a foundation, again, we are a 501c3 corporation, the state of Washington. And, it, uh, and so to that point, you know, is that we actually have a board and we're proud to say that today that we have a board president, a president of the foundation. PJ is with us here today. We elected her in a special vote uh, last uh, at last month's board meeting. Um, you know, PJ, you're here. Would you like to share a few comments? And we welcome you. Well, my last name isn't King, so that's that's good. I'm closer to you, Kelly, than to King. Anyway, me... I'm really pleased to be able to help out and learn. 
um, and support the whole foundation board. And I appreciate this opportunity. So uh, please contact me if you have anything that you need to have passed on to board that all work to support our master gardener work. And I'm thrilled to be able to help out. So thank you everyone for the vote of confidence. So PJ, thank you for allowing me to correct my slide while you were giving your introduction, <laughs> for sure. Always Kelly, always. Yeah, there you go. And of course, little known fact here is that both PJ and I, our, our last name, our, our last, our, both of our last names are Rupp. So it, uh, this, is, this is quite bizarre that it's, <laughs> it's not that uncommon a name, but you would find the two officers of the foundation both is Rupp here, but that's okay. We'll, you know, we'll let that little, that little tidbit hmm. get in there. Anyway, so this is your board. And of course, what we get together as a foundation, we have three purposes, three functions, right? You know, yes, we educate and we inform the communities of Grace Harbor and Pacific counties. We indeed fundraise, we raise money to help, you know, fuel our programs. And of course, we come together, you know, to socialize and to learn. So those are the three purposes very specifically and very explicitly laid out as to why we come together as a foundation. We remind ourselves, however, that we are a service organization. And as a service organization, this is our time to step up and volunteer. And there's no better time to volunteer than, you know, coming up, you know, at, uh, on the 24th of this month. And so, at, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I've done here on this slide is extract from that uh, the docent instructions um, that, uh, and there's a lot of text on here, uh, but those of you who are docents have seen this and have hopefully it, um, have started to internalize some of these lessons and thoughts um, that have to be prepared as we get ready for that, um, we're ready for the 24th. Any amplifications of this, um, Connie, you know, Charlene? Any additional comments you want to add on it, uh, on the docent instructions? She's muted. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'd like to say is that first and foremost, wear your badge, put it in your purse right now or your wallet or something. Don't forget to wear it. It's important. And also dressed appropriately and comfortably. You are representing WSU, Grace Harbor, Pacific County's Master Gardeners. And that's very important. Um, does, do all the docents have this sheet? <clears throat> yes. I'd, I'd like to think that you would have forward those forward that email to everyone. You know, they wouldn't necessarily have this particular slide, but they certainly should have your email with these instructions. Yeah, I think Terry, then you must have done that. Uh, yes, I I sent it out to the, all the garden reps, um, and also uh, I was at the Dolores Cavanaugh's docent meeting last Saturday and had it as a handout for that docent meeting. So um, for the, the, uh, two, um, the, the, the next two docent meetings for the other two gardens, it would probably be a good idea to print some out as handouts for the docent. I agree, system. yeah. So another thing, um, I'm trying to see what's up there that's not, what's not up there that I have. Um, a good idea is to bring a notepad and ask the guard, the um, homeowner. And if you've already had your homeowner walk through, you probably did this. But just have something to write things down, questions you want to ask, things they say about particular plants. Um, I think that's a, a great idea. And just mingle. You know, just have a great time. This is one of my favorite uh, activities that Master Gardener does. You get so many wonderful ideas from, from these beautiful gardens and it's, it's really fun. Again, wear your badge. 
<laughs> I like how you really opened up though this having fun. I think it is important to greet visitors with a smile and make sure that 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 you that they know you're having fun and that you're Absolutely. very welcoming and looking forward to that environment. And it's it's very fun to listen to the to the guests' comments. You know, they get all these wonderful ideas, and you can hear them saying, "Oh gosh, I'm going to go do that," and you know, so it, it's really an enjoyable time. Because of That's the size of the gardens, do you recommend that some of the docents might bring a portable lawn chair or something uh, that uh, for so, a little bit of rest? That would be totally up to them, I would think. But but we want them to mingle with the people. Yeah. So. Uh, also, um, that's one thing to check out for the garden reps in the gardens that you're at. We looked at Dolores's garden and she does have little sit spots in oh. lots of different places. So um, her garden, I think, is pretty well covered that way. And you might want to look at Robin's garden okay. uh, for a similar sort of, of uh, you know, just a check. Also, I'd just like to add that as in um, past tours, we have quite a few different handouts for um, visitors at these gardens. And they should be at our uh, check-in table where, where the tickets are stamped. We have, we're, once again, we're having a survey uh, which gives us some information about where our visitors come from. It also has a, a few simple questions about sustainability, which is a big piece of our educational part of, of um, our garden tour. So we get a little bit of information that way we get an idea of where they're coming from. And if they want to win uh, one of our beautiful blooming planters, uh, they, need to, they need to turn in their cards. Um, they can do it at any garden. So there's, there's the survey cards that are gonna be at the tables, which uh, docents will, may wanna mention, should mention, I should say. There's also gonna be information about the new training. Um, Jude prepared a, a handout for that. So you'll have, you'll have some flyers and some cards on, on the new training also at the ticket table. Um, and we also have a handout about su sustainability practices. Right. So there's, <laughs> there, there, there's a lot that's going to be at each of the ticket tables and docents should familiar, familiarize themselves with all of those pieces. So well, how are we Oh, sorry. How are we doing with respect to docents overall? Have you got enough? You know, do you need to reach out uh, for more? Uh, we have had great response from our volunteers. We have um, enough docents in the gardens. Although, if someone still wants to volunteer, we we welcome we welcome anyone who wants to be a docent in a garden. Um, Rhonda has gotten all of her requests met for volunteers at the plant sale. Right. So that's. That's uh, going along well. Um, Rick and Katie and Shushila have really talked up the tour on the radio and uh, Rick has gotten banners out and many, many of our volunteers have gotten posters up in various communities. So the publicity has gone extremely well too. And Mary has gotten out um, press releases for our uh, local, our dwindling local papers um so i i just think the tour is going to be wonderful the the gardens are absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, even though there's a lot of prep work still happening uh they they're they're ready to be on a tour today they are just gorgeous uh terry i have a question i should have asked you the other day which of the gardens are going to have porta potties for the public is it just down at the plant sale? Oh no, <laughs> we have we have sprung for Santa cans this year. We have <laughs> we have uh, uh, two at Dolores's garden. One is for um, visitors. Uh, she maintains one all the time in her garden in a in a kind of uh, closed off location for her gardeners, and it will also be for our docents. So um, there's, two, there's two in that garden, but only one for the public. Um, 
there's going to also be one at um, Beth, Beth Day Waters' garden. And then um, we, have, we have the um, handicap, uh, the, the larger uh, uh, Santa can at the plant sale along with a wash station. And Robin didn't feel like she needed one in her garden. Um, so she's, she's, um, she seems okay without a, a Santa can. Okay. It'd be good for the docents to know that, that they can tell the, the people who come and attend and they're looking for a restroom where you can tell them to go. Good yeah. point. Yeah. It's, well, it's probably pretty obvious where the, 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 the rented cans, right? You know, they're probably yeah. placed pretty obviously, I would think. Yes. Yes, yeah. they are. Yeah. Yeah. But that'd be great. No, this is super. So a reminder to all is that this is obviously it's a, um, you know, it's this is this is our most profitable, you know, venture of the year and that uh, our expenses are minimal because of all the volunteer activity. And it um, and a shout out, of course, to the to the three gardens, you know, all being produced by master gardeners, we remind you. So a tremendous effort from them, you know, of months work of preparation. And of course, you know, given the it, um, given the extreme dryness and heat of this summer, you know, the effort to maintain these gardens in these conditions is extraordinary. Is, you know, it's, it's 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 really asking an extraordinary effort from these people. So shout out to everybody's help in making this happen. Kelly, I have a question. Um, for those of us that won't be able to make it to any of the gardens, for instance, I'm working the plant sale all day. Is there in, going to be any kind of pictures, presentations, or any way for us to see these gardens after the fact or, or not? Well, I, I would uh, suggest, even though you've signed up to be at the, at the um, plant sale uh, for the entire time, that perhaps um, there will be some lapses in the number of people at the plant sale and you use some of those opportunities to to slip away and and go see a garden or two and also um i would be happy to spell you at that i've um i've kind of not signed up specifically for any uh particular job i would i'm i'm going to be a floater so um, if I know that, that you want to get out and see gardens, I will, I will fill in for you. I think okay. it's, a, and, and Brenda, don't, both Bev and I will be at the plant sale, you know, most of that, at, that day as well. So we'll be, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to spell you. Uh, but Terry, that it really is a good idea that Brenda shares is that, uh, you know, a, a strong set of pictures, uh, you know, from all the gardens would make for a great presentation later in the fall. If we can just think about just um, um, collecting some of those photos, certainly from our recognition luncheon in November, it's always great to have those photos there to share. Yes, I, I agree. So maybe when you're um, out in the gardens and you see some vignette that really um, uh, seems special, take, take a picture and we'll collect them for later. PJ's question in chat is very specific. Of course, where are tickets for sale and will tickets be uh, for sale at the, at the, on the tour, at the tour locations? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, each garden will have, um, well, right now they'll, they'll each have 10 tickets for sale. Uh, the, the other ticket locations are, there's, there's two locations in Ocean Shores. Um, wow, let's see. I don't have a poster in front of me. Um, Galway Flying Bay. Flying Cats, Flying Cats and Galway Bay. Thank you, thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, and uh, Dennis Company and Raymond, Dennis Company and Elma, uh, Marshall's uh, Pet and Garden in um, Aberdeen. Uh, Monty is, is the value drug in Hoquiam and- Harbor. Uh, Oh, wait, no. Okay. Value drug is Montesano, right? Right. right. Harbor drug in Hoquiam. Harbor drug, yes, in Hoquiam. So there's ticket, ticket outlets uh, through most of our communities. They are on the poster and the website. 
I think Terry, are, this is the okay. website. Are we going to have any for sale at the plant sale? Yes, the plant sale will also have um, at least 10. Hopefully, um, we'll have a handle on how many are selling at the ticket outlets and we might be able to move more, more to the plant sale. And Terry, at this point, given this, um, given the stage four or phase four we are at, you know, um, there's no restrictions about, um, we don't have to ration attendance at, at any particular garden, right? We're okay. There's no concerns about crushes of people coming. Um, yes, that's my understanding. Uh, we don't have to count visitors to in each garden uh, like, like we would have had to do a month ago. So um, th this is, this is going to be more like our regular tours where we just welcome and talk to guests. If, if, uh, if you see something that doesn't look safe, right, then yeah. we really should say something, you know, you if, 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 if somebody is running around hugging people, we might not want that to happen. <laughs> So no hugging. Okay, very good. <laughs> we have that. We have that in the dose and instructions here. That's for sure. Just to do a lot of fist bumping. Okay. Anything else in the garden tour? Okay. So uh, obviously, could I, uh, could I mention that uh, you don't have to have a ticket to go to the plant sale? You can go there and buy as much as you want without a ticket if you're so inclined. There you go. Rick is always a student of good commerce. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks all. Looking forward to it in a big way. So um, with respect to plants, Terry, any particular other instructions with respect to plants that we as master gardeners are preparing for the sale? Uh, well, be sure and, and have uh, the plants identified. They really need to have tags, plant tags on each plant. And if you can only do one and you've got a dozen of them, okay. I think Rhonda has some volunteers signed up early to, um, to um, do whatever tagging needs to happen. But at least one of your plants should have a plant tag for identification. And I believe the e-news has instructions in terms of where to uh, collect them and, and share them, correct? Yes, there's there's a early um, collection point in downtown Satsup at um, the Valentine's uh, business, and they'll be in a in a a, a locked um, area and then transported to the plant sale early on Saturday morning. Yep. Okay. So other announcements, other announcements from the from the tribe here. Helen, there's always an announcement from you. Certainly you have something to share with us today. Oh, I was gonna lay low. Uh, for your information, those people who have access to a Timberland Regional Library, you might go in and just take a look around. Uh, they're trying to do a standardization process, which is not real, always the right thing to do in an area that prides itself on diversity. Each library is unique and should be respected as such. But at our library, they went in and they said, okay, you are only allowed four plants, only four. None of them can be blooming. <laughs> what? What's that got to do with it? Our, our staff love their plants and they had beautiful plants. Nope, only four. And take down all those posters. Huh? And uh, I, I heard that this is strictly hearsay, but I heard that the person who was doing this took a look at the library tables in the hoquiam, the, the standard, you know, those gorgeous, what are those doing? You know, well, those, 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 you know, those aren't going to fit what we want done. I think they are getting the idea that we, we might have some independent ideas. You know, people who use libraries tend to be radical like that, they think. So if you notice some changes in your library that you do not approve of, you might consider going to TRL webpage, seeing what their goals and objectives are, including we value diversity, 
and uh, drop a little letter to the TRL board. It's going to take more than one person complaining to have any changes made. Thank you. And so you'll be leading a protest, uh, you know, library, <laughs> library lives matter, you know, I think soon. Yes, uh, yes. We're, okay. we've got a couple of letters in the yes. ready to go. Public library radicalization right here. You heard it first. Yes. <laughs> Other not. announcements. Other announcements. Yes. Thank you. Alina, any thoughts and perspectives from you from the coordinator role? Um, How are we doing and getting our hours in on that uh, on the in the new system? We're we're doing pretty good. There's still people um, who haven't submitted any hours yet, and I'm going to be contacting them. Uh, they've claimed their account. They just haven't put any hours in yet. So I'm going to be contacting them in the coming weeks to just see if they need any help or if they can be facilitated in any way. People that do not have an email account, we now have a procedure where they will fill out a timesheet, send it to me monthly at the end of each month, and I will be able to enter their hours in. So that was a relief for me. Um, other than that, uh, Give Pulse has been, the support system has been really helpful to me. I don't even try and problem solve anymore. I just send questions to Give Pulse support and I CC the person that had the question. So like, for example, Holly had two accounts and she, told them after I started the conversation, she communicated with them which account she wanted deleted and I didn't even have to worry about it. So all of these problems, big and small, um, are being dealt with and I we're just moving along. Most excellent. Other announcements? A couple of things I wanted to share obviously is that you know as we get into next month, you know, it's fair month. And it, um, so we'll have our, the county, the Grays Harbor Fair, of course, early in the month, the Pacific County Fair near the end of the month. Um, both Cindy and Mike are on the, uh, are on the, uh, the Zoom here today. Um, comments from either of you with respect to, you know, your need for volunteers, preparations. We certainly read, uh, Cindy, your note in the, at, um, in the E! News. Anything else to share, Mike and Cindy? Um, no, I was up visiting uh, with Rod, the fair manager, this morning to see if they at least had set the cost of uh, fair entrance and parking tickets, and they haven't done that yet. So, so uh, there's still, you know, there's still work to be done. <laughs> we don't have all the information, uh, but we are actually for those who, who are interested in working at the Grays Harbor County Fair, the fair hours are actually gonna be from noon to 10.30 at night. And so we're actually gonna only have, have two shifts for volunteers. And the first one will be from noon to three and the second one will be from three to six. Anything after six, um, Leroy or Lee Sisk is gonna be there. And I think um, Chris has offered to maybe do a little bit of the later stuff too. So, but we'll, we'll be covered for most of it. So I think we're in pretty good shape, but if anybody else wants to, um, to sign up to work the fair, uh, you need to contact me. So it's a key point about re you know reaching out to Cindy if you wanna work the Grace Harbor Fair. Reminder to everybody that I mean, this is kind of our, 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 you know, the front door, if you will, to the Master Gardener program. We had what, nearly 3000 people last, or two years ago, yeah. if you will. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that was kind of a standard kind of number of people. So yeah. And, that's, and those are only the people we count who during the time that we are, have our set, uh, you know, our shifts, we, we go off shift about four o'clock normally. So anything after four o'clock in the past, we haven't counted those people necessarily. So we, there's more than 3000, but still that's a lot. Mike, I know our Pacific County fair is much smaller. But it, uh, but indeed, you got new facilities this year. We do. We've got a great opportunity to um, build our new location. Thanks to Tony Gwen and Sue Carbaugh, have helped out immensely. 
created a committee to help out with the relocation of the booth that we're going to have. Elena has banners for us. Take a look at those. And so it's an exciting time to be able to build this new little area that we have and, and promote that and working with the people that have the, the flowers and being in the same building with them. So everything's very dynamic right now. I've created a committee and have Jan Roach, Renee Powell, Elena Regatini, and Brenda Priestley have all volunteered to help me with the Pacific County Fair. And it's just got a great team, really uh, exciting time. So we're just like Cindy, we're building everything up and making it uh, work for us. So there's still more to come and please for help for people to fill the booth hours. So yeah, it's a good time. So thank you. So even if you're from Grays Harbor County and you'd like to volunteer at the Pacific County Fair, you know, come on down, you know, reach out to Mike. Other big event, of course, coming up in September, and we can't say this, we can't say this enough, this is a great opportunity to get your continuing ed hours. This conference, the state conference is virtual this year. Um, there's still the early bird uh, uh, rate is, uh, is still on. Um, uh, we actually checked this past week, um, Grays Harbor and Pacific counties, uh, our foundation has the most members already signed up for the state foundation. Uh, conference. So uh, let's kick a little fanny and uh, and really show the state just who we are. Um, so again, it's it's at the very end of September. Um, it's all virtual. Um, it's a good program. And it um, so it's mglearns.org, mglearns.org. And it, uh, the, the point I really want to emphasize, there's no excuse for not making continuing ed hours, you know, by having this virtual opportunity to, to, to join in. Um, Karen, any questions, any comments uh, from your stamp, from the state perspective? Okay, no worries. <laughs> just the, I'm, I'm sorry, did, what did you ask me? I, I would just, it, any, any comments from you as a state rep, you know, regarding the conference, regarding the state conference coming up? Um, no, no, um, I'm on the awards committee, so that's been fun. <laughs> Picking people for Master Gardener of the Year and uh, the Ed Lacrosse Award and uh, the Media Award. And my so. understanding is they've already set the, um, uh, we know that we'll be in Olympia for the 2022 conference. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So the 2022 <laughs> conference will also be, it'll be face to face and virtual, I believe. And it, uh, but most We're, importantly. Yeah, that's what the, we're aiming for. And most importantly, Olympia is far more accessible than, say, you know, the eastern part of the state. So this is a, a great opportunity for the next two years here to make sure that our, our continuing ed hours are, are indeed well covered. Yes. A quick reminder to everyone regarding phishing, atta uh, phishing attacks on email. Um, this is a slide I put up in past, uh, in past uh, uh, foundation meeting presentations, and I, can't, I continually want to emphasize it. The era of ransomware is very serious. I mean, to date, it's hitting only corporations and businesses, but it's 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 you know it's not we're not far from uh, from attacking individuals, right? You know, with their own little individual ransomware. So I encourage you, if you don't recognize that email address, you know, don't open, don't even open the email, and certainly do not open any attachments on this thing. So it's, um, and make sure, and I just, this, you know, I can't say this enough, you know, make sure you've got an up-to-date virus subscription like McAfee or Norton. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and there's just, there's no substitute for it. Um, and I, it just, it's one of these things that um, uh, one of our ports, one of our, our port authorities here was just compromised just two weeks ago because one of the port commissioners mistook an email that looked to be official. It looked to be an official state, you know, uh, email and um, ended up, you know, you know, here she's, you know, her whole computer locked up and, you know, all of her passwords had to be redone. So the point is it uh, even you may think of yourself as a sophisticated user, but I tell you, it's, um, it's, 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 there's, there's the, um, it's insidious, the attacks that are out there. So uh, be warned and be prepared. Um, Kelly, can I ask a question, please? Please go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, a master gardener whose name I won't mention uh, just had, uh, he's, this person's had a couple of things go on. Um, could you send, an, an, another thing just happened this week, I think. Could you, um, 
could you send this uh, email this information? If 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 you if you if you want to send me who I should send it to, I'd be happy to share it. So if, um, you, if you don't if you don't want to or put it in chat to me, and that's I'll take it I'll take it from there. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks. Okay. Uh, which do you prefer, email or chat? Either. It's, it's, send it to email to be fine. Then it okay. just, but but no worries. I'm I'm happy to share. Uh, but again, my recommendation is just is very simple, right? You know, is that um, just be very thoughtful about what emails you open. Um, and this is this is this especially if you're on the phone or something or on your tablet, you may not be thinking um, and looking at the addresses as carefully as you should before you click open. So. So and then and a quick reminder also with respect to uh, uh, spam, uh, be sure that you are whitelisting or blocking addresses that you either want to receive or don't want to receive. And of course, we want to make sure that you're receiving all emails from Katie Lutz or from John Coogan. Um, so it, uh, you want to make sure that they're on your whitelist. And de depending upon what email application you use, there is a different process. And so um, you either can Google that, you know, just do a search in terms of, you know, how to whitelist an email in Gmail, for example, if that's what you use. And you'll find, uh, you'll find instructions here. Um, it's very helpful to, um, it's, and it's very, it's, this is a good shortcut right away to, uh, to, to put spam in your, um, uh, to, to quickly throw spam away. Okie doke. Upcoming programs, I appreciate everybody's patience in all this, upcoming programs, our own Mike Carvia will be here next month. So we will have a August Zoom meeting on the 10th of August. This of course is extraordinary because we typically don't have any meetings in August, right? Because of the fairs. But because, um, because Zoom is so efficient and effective, we are gonna have a foundation meeting on August 10th. And Mike will be here to share excerpts of his very excellent firewise landscaping training that he is that it's one of the highlights of the of the uh, the, of the intern training of the woody landscape training that uh, mike participates in every other year and so uh, i wanted to make sure that all the foundation had a chance to share of some of mike's uh, learnings reminder for everyone who doesn't know mike is a retired professional firefighter so he comes to us, you know, with just a little bit more than average understanding of what it takes to uh, to, to manage yourself in a uh, in a nasty situation. And of course, given that we're given that fire season started, you know, in the uh, in the forest of Oregon, California, and Washington far earlier than ever before, and that uh, this is the right time to be thinking about um, uh, reminding ourselves of proper precautions for preparing our own homes and landscapes for fire danger. Mike, any comments, perspectives? Nope, nothing to add. Thank you for the invite and really looking forward to it. Very timely and very appropriate too. That'll be August 10th. But right here today, mind you, I want to welcome to us Pat Munts, who I see is with us here today. And Pat, that's a, you know, it's, it is, again, as, as we've been talking, it's, it is, it has been a delight in the Zoom times we live in to be able to tap into expertise that we would not ever hope to, to gain uh, because you're sitting over there on the far end of the state. You, you know, you can't get much further east than you, and you can't get much further west than us. <laughs> and so uh, it was, it was a delight to come across you and to come across your book because, you know, you obviously, you know, have actually, this is, you know, this, what else, you know, what, a, what, a, the fact that you actually could get that title for your book, you know, that, uh, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, this is, this is obviously something that everyone, everyone should have on their bookshelf. So it really is an honor to have you here with us today. And, uh, and uh, to, we're eager to hear from you, especially, especially, from the types of interactions you have with first time gardeners, because this is one of the things that we, of course, are seeing a lot as master gardeners, as you can appreciate, people that are just getting into gardening, right, you know, because of the pandemic. And we want to make sure that their experience is positive, successful and happy. And so I'm always curious about these, the, the, the questions and the issues that you see that can uh, be most beneficial to, you know, early stage gardeners. Welcome. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see, 
yeah, just as a, by way of introduction, I'm, uh, of course, Pat Munts. I'm, this, I'm uh, the small farms and urban ag coordinator for WSU Spokane County Extension. Um, I'm a, a Spokane County uh, Master Gardener Emeritus. Uh, and I write uh, a weekly column in our big spokesman review paper. Um, but for you folks, you know, I'm, I'm not just an east sider, and you're right, we're only about 10 miles from the Idaho border, but I grew up in Shelton. So mm -hmm. I know um, the southern part of the Olympics um, very well. Um, I have my favorite beaches that I dearly miss saltwater. Um, but I, I, one of the, the, the uh, crowning, uh, I, I say, we'll say achievements of this book was because of that interest, both myself and my co-author, having lived on both sides of the state, uh, were able to address the growing conditions and the issues that are faced by uh, folks on what we call the coast over here and those of us who are in the inland Northwest, which is uh, east of the, the Cascades. And so it's, um, it's kind of an interesting um, parallel. So do I have any way of uh, sharing a screen? Yeah, so you can uh, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. So I'm going to present. Um, oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Just as an a introduction, um, <laughs> the funny thing about this book, it comes with a good story. Um, the, my uh, editors wanted to call it the Pacific Northwest Gardener's Handbook. Well, if you call Pacific Northwest, you're talking about stuff that's west of the Cascade. And I told them, uh, no, we're all of the Northwest. So they, they changed the title on this. Um, so let's see here. But um, just as a way of talking about the diversity that we have. Uh, this is the whole river valley uh, in the whole uh, visitor area there. What, 120, 180 inches of rain a year on a normal year. Uh, 135 miles west east of Seattle is uh, the Vantage Bridge across uh, the Columbia for I-90. They get eight inches of rain a year both be <clears throat> because of um, the Cascades. This is in the rain shadow of the Cascades. So the mountain air, and this, this same thing happens when you go uh, uh, from uh, the Pacific up over the Olympics and somewhat in there in the, in the hills there in uh, Pacific County. Um, as the, the clouds rise, they cool and that forces them to drop their moisture. So they, the west sides of peaks are, uh, the mountains are always very much wetter. And this is being on the east side is very dry. This last photo is of the Palouse just south of Spokane. And here, um, the elevation here at Vantage is like 800 feet maybe. Spokane is at 2000. So you've been rising in elevation uh, between the, the Columbia River and Spokane, and hence the uh, uh, precipitation zones are beginning to condense as you, as you head towards the Rockies. And so the trees come back in again. So we have a very diverse state. Now, uh, rainfall. This is kind of an interesting map in that you can see where we have the larger, uh, the steeper mountains and where the rising uh, storms and things off the Pacific drop their moisture. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you how many rainy winters, you know, you never see the sun for two months. 
Um, and then here, here's the rain shadow of the, of the uh, uh, coastal mountains. And this is why Seattle gets only 35 inches of rain. Shelton gets 60 and what's, what's Grays Harbor in there get? 80, 90? Um, and again, here's the Cascades. And they create a much bigger, uh, um, uh -huh. Okay, dry zone behind, and you can see how quickly it dries out. Here's about where the Vantage Bridge is, and you can see that's probably the lowest amount of rain in the in the uh, state. Here you can see Spokane, and in my area here, our weather station is out west of town, and officially it's 15 to 17 inches of rain a year. But we're rising so quickly here in elevation that by we by we the time you get to my place, which is about 15 miles east of the airport, uh, it's 20 inches of rain. And by the time you get over here to Port Lane, we're up to 25 inches. And so that's a very diverse, um, uh, you know, amount of moisture. And, and we, you know, we it's interesting for us when we garden here because we kind of say, all right, where are you, west of town or east of town? Frost dates are also important. And this is one question you'll get a lot of from uh, new gardeners or people who are moving into your area. Because if they're moving in from um, um, other parts of Oregon and Washington, um, they're gonna be used to frost dates, uh, you know, much uh, later than, than you uh, get to experience. And so teaching them to that, no, you don't have to worry about frost in, in May in, in Hoquiam. Um, that will help them learn how to, to pick um, plants. And I'm thinking particularly vegetable plants, though I'm fully aware that growing uh, tomatoes, corn, and peppers in your end of the world, um, boy, that's a feat. <clears throat> my mother tried to raise tomatoes. We lived right on the water uh, on Oakland Bay and she tried to grow tomatoes for years and never really had much success because it was just too cold. So um, that's uh, just the kind of conditions that we're, <clears throat> we're facing. So how do you help new gardeners? Um, the best thing you can do is become very familiar with your area. And it's nice having a group spread out all over two counties here um, because you can, you can learn what, where are the microclimates? Where are the um, areas that uh, have a lot of, you know, very dense forests, which are going to affect how things go. But if you, if you gain a knowledge of the area and then that person that new person comes in and say, well, I'm living up, you know, such and such creek road, or I'm down on the beach, you know, you will have a very good idea of, you know, what their, their conditions are. And that uh, really helps people to visualize, because if you can take it down to their, you know, very close to their garden, then they can grasp. It. So, you know, if, um, have a discussion amongst your group about where are the major um, uh, microclimates in the area. I'm sure, you know, of course, along the beach, you have that the area that's affected by the wind and the salt and the sandier soil. You have, uh, you know, a certain amount of hills um, in Pacific County and then also at the foothills of the, of the Olympics. So where does the cold air drain down those, those valleys? Because cold air sinks. And it's surprising how small an area can be for a microclimate, but understand where your, your air uh, flows. Um, here we've had cases where um, some, some uh, the bottoms of some of our valleys um, are like 10 or 20 degrees colder than, than other areas. You don't have that extreme, but you still have colder areas. Uh, learn uh, where, you know, learn about the soils. 
Um, you've got a lot of variable soils in that area, both because of the ocean. Um, in the northern part of the region, uh, you have the last uh, influences of the glacial um, epochs. Um, you don't have quite the gravel bars that they have up in through Puget Sound and Shelton and the like, but you do have uh, boggy areas, you have clay areas, uh, but learn where your soils are. And then you're able to talk to those new folks about um, what they should plan for. And I always recommend somebody if they're new that they do a really good soil test. And um, I don't, I'm not a real believer in the, the uh, soil test kits you buy at the hardware store. They're just, they're just not accurate enough, but you can send uh, soil samples to a couple of labs in Moses Lake uh, that um, will give you your, at least your NPK readings uh, for somewhere under $50, but that may help uh, someone realize that uh, you know maybe they've got some really acidic soils uh, there and that will affect how they plant things. Um, you know that area that region in where you are uh, obviously grows cranberries but also there's a lot of blueberry production because of the more acidic soils um, and then uh, a lot of the plants that you have there are prefer acidic soil but there are going to be pockets and understanding the soil helps a new gardener um, to uh, become familiar. So um, I'm going to take questions, um, you know, kind of break this up a little bit. I'm, how much time have I got, guys? Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, torture you, Pat, but obviously we're eager, you know, we'll, we'll be here, you know, for, for all questions to be asked and answered here. So it, uh, okay. the only thing I have is I have to be done by 1.30. <laughs> so if I, what do, what do I have for questions? I wanted to kick it off just by talking about your book in particular. Is that the, uh, yeah. um, you know, is it, it, what's it aimed, you know, who's it aimed for? A, a novice, an expert? Um, does um, it... Well, it's me. It's kind of a cross between a novice and probably somebody with a little more experience. Um, I we didn't want to make it so simplistic that um, you know it just didn't attract everybody. But uh, it's it's aimed for someone who wants to learn more about their environment for growing. And both my co-author and I believe that understanding the foundations of soil, uh, climate, um, and, and everything uh, is really critical to understanding how to garden. So that was the main focus of it. And then um, we broke it out into chapters um, that the first few chapters were basic information on sustainable, um, for, uh, gardening uh, techniques, um, things that we've both, we have both learned about the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then each, there are chapters for um, annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, lawn, vegetables, uh, so forth. We broke it into plant categories. And plants are described there, it's the growing conditions, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, can look up, um, uh, you know, at the particular plant. Um, and one, one thing we did that doesn't affect you guys so much is, but we made sure that 80% of the plants would grow on this side of the mountains. Um, because so often um, books, unfortunately, have, are written for the Northwest, but they're written by West Siders who have never experienced a minus 20 winter or uh, 110 degree summer. Um, we broke our rec all time record here, couple, what, three weeks ago at 109, and it was 110 in our garden here. So um, it was, we tried to break it into groups so that people could use it as a quick reference. Each of the plant chapters is, has a calendar of uh, 
through the season of things you should be doing in particular uh, in the garden uh, so that you can you can look it up uh, where there's quite was quite a diversity of how to handle things we broke that out into a couple of different comments under a particular date so it's it's the kind of a book that you can quick you can pick up for quick reference or you can sit down and read uh, for uh, content. So it's it's a little it's there's a lot there. Questions for Pat. I'm actually curious about your small farms role as well. You know, Pat. You know that um, you know it because uh, you obviously uh if, if you have you seen just again in the past couple of years you know with this the flight from urban environments into rural areas you know folks moving out to the the spokane area in particular where, where you're centered on and looking to start a new life you know raising raising sheep or starting a new you know some sort of new orchard or something well there are a number of people and they're not just young people they're they're folks who uh you know are retiring spokane being uh home to fairchild air force base we get a lot of military folks that are, retire out and then they want to start another project so um we we uh the wsu small farm uh program offers um food systems program offers uh, a whole series of classes called Cultivating Success. And these are classes that, that start with uh, whole, what they call whole, whole farm planning. And that's for people who are beginning to, um, uh, beginning a farm project. And it covers all kinds of things that you need to consider from you know, marketing to plant production, animal production, uh, insurance, taxes, and uh, uh, finances. Uh, everything that you could need to really consider uh, before you start a farm. And then we follow that up with a course in the winter, uh, the whole farm planning classes in the fall and the uh, egg, egg entrepreneurship classes in the spring or in the winter, excuse me. And that is where you can take all of the information you gained in the first class and begin to put together a um, business plan for a farm. Now, one thing is if some of you are wondering if a farm is in your future, we actually just put out uh, the promotional materials for a course that's going to be August, the evening of August 3rd, all virtual. Um, called is a small farm in your future. And that will be a class that kind of introduces people to the idea of a farm from a very basic standpoint. It's free. Uh, if you Google, um, oh, let's see, they just put it out and I'm trying to remember. Cultivating success is, is a small farm in your future. Uh, you'll probably get to the link. If not, get a hold of um, the, uh, extension office in Grays or Mason County, uh, and they can get you the information. Uh, they've got small farm coordinators there. The biggest challenge I find with, with, uh, small, with small farm people is people finding being able to find land that they can afford. Uh, that's a major challenge because, uh, you know, I don't know how the, what the housing prices are doing out in, in your region, but they're, here they just went nuts this spring. And so trying to find enough land to really start a farm uh, and then um, having uh, you know, a, a good soil on it is it's a, it's a major challenge. And then the finances, um, you know, with the with the high cost of it is is sometimes a little hard for a younger couple to to do uh, the military folk and actually get loans through the VA for buying small farms. So, um, but I work, you know, with folks to try and improve their businesses. I do a lot of pasture walks for uh, noxious weed uh, control. Uh, we teach classes in, uh, in all kinds of aspects of farming. Uh, 
we teach the class here for Spokane uh, to certify people to have um, pigs, sheep, and goats on their urban property. So we just do a wide range of things um, that helps network the, the small farm uh, pro, uh, community together and produce food for the community. So you're responsible for that, uh, for encouraging our neighbors to bring chickens and peacocks into their, uh, into their, their lands and uh, wake us up at four or five in the morning. So, right. Well, uh, chicken <laughs> may be okay. Peacocks. <laughs> Questions. They're really good burglar alarms. Let's we'll put it that way. <laughs> Questions for Pat. I, uh, I've got on the screen share, of course, you know, her email and her phone. And it uh, and 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 again, this is this is one of the resources, you know, as we have available, you know, with WSUs, reach out to these these uh, these specialists, right? You know, if uh, if we have questions, um, these are tremendous resources with tremendous depth of knowledge, as Pat is evidence as as evidence from you know what Pat is sharing here this morning. Mike, you have a comment? Yeah. A uh, question for Patricia. The uh, very interesting. The the WSU small farm program is pretty exciting to hear about that. Uh, do you cover much in the way of processing the animals here? You're covering raising and um, good husbandry, um, and then what about the processing component? Well, animal husbandry. Yeah, we 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 uh, we have livestock specialists that I often refer to folks because. I'm kind of the, 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 the sifter, you know, I, I, have, I have a whole university to, to draw from. And if, if I don't know about it, I go find, my, find a faculty member that knows more. Processing issue, wow. That is such a hot button right now. Um, I think anyone that raises animals and wants to get a process realizes that even uh, there's two types of processing for meat. There's there's the, the custom cut and then there's the USDA. Custom cut is fine, you know, if you want to buy a quarter or a half or a whole of an animal, as long as you got the freezer space, but you cannot market those uh, that meat to to buy the cut to the uh, public. You have to have USDA processing in the pro to be able to sell by the cut. Well, custom cut folks are disappearing from our landscape and the ones that can handle USDA are even, even uh, fewer. Uh, and it's a huge issue uh, that's tied up in state law and in federal uh, regulations with the USDA, which uh, manages um, all of the, the USDA inspectors. And so, there's um, some moves afoot uh, in the legislature. Uh, didn't, didn't go anywhere this year, but uh, to allow uh, a different structure of meat processing here so that we that, uh, it would be easier for producers to sell um, their individual cuts of meat. Um, there's uh, been several efforts to start up some kind of mobile processing, but that kind of is stymied because um, moving a trailer around other to uh, different farms opens the farms up to uh, contamination from other diseases if you're bringing other animals in. Um, or uh, they need to run a trailer, uh, a processing trailer, especially USDA, you have to have a tested water source. And most farms are operating on their domestic wells or on their wells so that, uh, you know, every time you brought the trailer in, you have to get your water tested. So it's a big challenge right now. There are several people on this side of the state that are trying to work on that. Um, the WSU group, uh, food assistance team has what they call the Washington Meat Up, M-E-A-T, and that's working on those issues. You can Google those and, and try and start following that, but it's it's a thorny issue. Yeah, I just pushed that uh, Meat Up into the chat because that uh, a quick search uh, for WSU and meat processing led us right to that M-E-A-T Up. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's um, you know and it's and it's we need we need uh, small processors to 
speak up uh, and and get in touch with people and then follow those issues because uh, if we do get something going in the legislature, uh, the only way it's going to get out of committee is if enough people start um, talking to their representatives and say, hey, this is important to us. And I don't think I have to tell anybody how important our small scale um, uh, farm production system was to the communities last uh, this last year. Um, I know our, our farm committee community here pivoted in under 10 days to begin uh, selling food to uh, <clears throat> or giving food or you know getting food to people who were losing their jobs and things like that and they they basically fed our community over here for a number of months um, so you know the whole issue of you know paying attention to our small scale farmers is is of critical importance. Um, it doesn't get the uh, the support because small farms are scattered all over the place. They don't have a unifying uh, uh, organization to go lobby the legislature. Um, and some people, I hate to say it, they say, oh, well, I only raise a couple cows. Well, you're part of the system if you just raise a couple of beef. Um, and you need to acknowledge that you are you are a farmer of those those, those animals, and uh, take your place with the with the the rest of the farm community because it's those little one things that can come together to make big things happen. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, any special future challenges that you see? Uh, you know, for that uh, for 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 for. Gardening in the Northwest, for example, is climate change being talked about, and um, you know, uh, amongst the uh, amongst your WSU colleagues, as you know, as as something we need to be paying far more attention to at the small local scale. Um, uh, ocean acidification is a big deal out here that we concern ourselves with. Um, obviously, drought, just as we've been discussing, right? You know, and the fact that these the intense. Um, sequences, cycles, right, of heat and uh, and and rain, and so it just it is a the the ups and downs that uh, are yeah. quite dramatic these days. Well, yeah, I, I think this summer has been the major wake up call to a lot of things. Um, WSU's had some co uh, discussions on it, um, and I know <clears throat> if you've gardened in a in a <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, a place for a long time, you've probably noticed some changes in the, in the climate, you know, in the last 20 years. Um, here, we, we now have a fall gardening season because our frosts aren't coming the 15th of September. They're more like the 10th of October or so. Um, and our summer uh, have got, become hotter and drier. Um, Right now, uh, the sunlight coming down here right now is a little bit hazy with fires all around Spokane. Um, <clears throat> and the 110 degree heat that we had here recently, I, I actually had the new growth on my conifers wilting because it was so hot and so dry. So we're pouring water on stuff here just to, to make, if nothing else, a fire break. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about fire uh, a little bit more as a prep for your talk next month. Um, <clears throat> but um, the challenge is going to be um, watching plants that, that may not survive the heat. But the, the, the upside is, um, you know, maybe we start getting warmer and we can actually grow zone six plants in Spokane. Um, you know, that, that would be a treat um, because right now the first thing I look at at a plant tag is, you know, what zone is it? Um, because we, we just have to pay attention to that. Um, you know, where you are and starting to get dry summers, um, you know, traditionally people don't water lawns or gardens or much <clears throat> on the west side. You're going to have to start thinking about uh, sprinkler systems, uh, at least for certain plants. Um, 
and begin to put those in because um, it's the only way you're gonna you're going to be able to keep up with the water. Most of our <clears throat> our plants here, our native plants anyway, you know, they're used to the Mediterranean climate that we have, and so they'll they'll hunker down for the the, the heat, uh, the hot part of the driest part of the summer. But um, you know, this dryness that we've got now is beyond that just being able to hunker down, they're gonna need water. So that's one thing for gardeners I, I would uh, make sure is you, that you have some way to irrigate your plants. Maybe it's just a, a, you know, some, buy some more sprinklers and hoses, but um, maybe it's a, it's a whole system. But one of the things that I use that is just such a, a, a saving grace is I buy electronic uh, hose end timers and they're run battery powered. And you can set up your watering so that it comes on. You don't have to be out there to drag the hose. You can get them for <clears throat> under $35. Um, and a battery will last, might even last a couple of years, but they're, they make a huge difference in being able to, to manage a large landscape. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we're just all going to have to be observant as to what what bites the dust. Maybe is it if it stays hot, or what? All of a sudden, we can we can start growing that we we didn't previously be able to. Other questions for Pat. Mike, you have another question. I do. This is my third year battling the imported currant worm on my gooseberries. And I, I wasn't ready for when Kelly had asked about this. Uh, so I've developed a technique where I go around with needle nose pliers and I pick the worms off, flip them in the uh, chicken pen. They love them, recycle them that way. Are they ever going to go away? Uh, I, I'm resisting the urge to spray. I know that the, that the larva lives in the soil down below and each year they come out. At the end of May is my target, and I'm out there every day for one hour, circling the my all my gooseberry bushes before the uh, the current worm uh, absolutely denudes the plant of foliage. It's just devastating. So the the, the moral of the story is: Are they ever going to go away? No. For, for what not. I'm having. But. You and remember, this is this is a mental health problem for Mike, as you can see here. It's, it's you know. This... Hey, Mike. This is what I tell people who 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 you know have me walk out through ten acres of noxious weeds, but I don't want to use spray. All right. Here's the thing. Chemicals are are a tool. If they can get a handle on a problem and get it back under control, so that you can go back to using your uh, more benign and organic methods, then, then maybe that's what you have to do. Um, so, you know, uh, you've got an issue there. They're, yes, they overwinter in the soil. Um, you know, you're lucky there, the ground doesn't freeze. If you go out in the winter and maybe stir around when you do get a spate of uh, cold weather and bring up some of those larvae and let them freeze, then okay, that, that might be good. But this is another thing about climate change that we're going to see. We're going to see insects coming into our area that we never thought we could get, we would get. And oh, in many cases, uh, our, our, you know, the winters kill off a lot of insects, uh, especially over here. But we're gonna see new infestations. Um, there's already reports of uh, Japanese beetles um, in pockets in the Northwest. And if you've ever lived on in the eastern part of the country, you know what kind of damage those guys can do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's they're they're not going to go away. <laughs> you're just going to have to you're just going to have to bite the bullet. <laughs> but you know, there's there's uh, there's organic chemicals. I mean, I would check on whether an insecticidal soap would be. Um, apropos for that that worm and that is considered an organic um, and try that you know try your most benign methods first 
uh, and you have to move up the chain to, hard, to uh, stronger stuff than you do. I think it was an appropriate comment, Pat. You make a comment that you know chemical control is indeed a tool, and we should have that tool in our arsenal. And indeed, for that, uh, just for Mike's mental health, you know, I think it's important to, uh, you know, it, uh, if he's out there every morning with his needle nose pliers, I think he does have a problem. But I think we all should work yeah. to interv intervene, Mike. Yeah, it's time to time for an intervention here. <laughs> Pat, I want to thank you so very much for joining us here today. You know, is that uh, folks, you know, you see her, her, uh, her, her name, her email and her phone number are, are posted on the slide here. Um, um, check out her, check out the book, you know, that's for sure. And these are, these are always great gifts, by the way, you know, for, uh, for family and friends. So don't hesitate to that. And that, uh, uh, and Pat, it's just, it's been great having a chance to meet you and to talk with you and to thank you for this, your service and your, you know, that the, the contributions you've made uh to gardeners in your area yeah. let me make one one more comment on fire it's not if it's when and you'll find this out next month when you have your speaker i've been run out twice by by fires here and it is the scariest thing in the world when you have to look around your house and say all right what can i grab in 10 minutes we start, we have boxes on my, the desk behind me here now that have our valuables in them right now so that we can um, bail out of here quickly, including the cat carrier. The one, one advantage of installing <coughs> sprinklers is that they may very well be fire protection for your property. Um, if you can keep a green space, 20 to 30 feet out from your house, you're going to stand a better chance of uh, not having issues. So all I can say is come to your talk next, next month and pay attention because I think uh, the west side of the state is, is, is going to have one of those fires eventually that just burns thousands and thousands of acres and you cannot stop it and all you can do is run if you can run so um that's my last 10 cents it's worth <laughs> your optimism you. and enthusiasm is outstanding <laughs> it's just I, i'm glad you're leaving us with that uplifting note there right oh, you know? oh, well you know <laughs> it's reality <laughs> it is it is reality and it's and it's advice it's advice well taken indeed can, can i ask a question please kathleen okay um I um, I learned that a lot of blueberries, uh, for instance, were fried by the heat wave we had, and uh, for instance, in Elma, sets up. And I'm wondering if there was any way that could have been prevented. Probably the only thing that could have been done was during that uh, hot weather to have a almost continuous water supply on those plants. Blueberries have a very fine root system. They're like rhododendrons and that those roots are right at the surface. And the heat was so harsh uh, that it was pulling moisture out of the leaves faster than the roots could keep up with it. And there was damage. You know, I'll, I'll echo that Kathleen is that uh, I visited with a couple of our local nurseries and uh, they, because of course they had the forecast for the heat, they put their staff on notice and they started watering continually right until the ground was literally mud right mm -hmm. but it uh, it did save their their inventory mm -hmm. so should it be should the water be on the berries and the leaves too or mainly on the ground you know it's whatever way you can get it on them um i think in this in this uh issue with with this hot dry weather i'm not sure drip irrigation uh or soaker hoses is going to keep up with it so I would say, you know, uh, putting out overhead watering sprinklers would probably be the most efficient and leave them on overnight. Wow. Thank you very much. You, you cannot overwater a plant in this heat. There is no way. One comment I have is, uh, our house, we have two really not beautiful oak trees, and we've lived here, they're like 70 years old. 
and they're always so beautiful and the leaves are always so shiny and green. Never have we ever had leaves burn on those trees. And we watered the ground really good and all that, but that was the direct sun I felt like that did that. Yeah. I, I have a, a little hemlock and the needles on the south, uh, south mm -hmm. side of the top got fried because it just couldn't keep up. Yeah, I noticed that along the highways, a lot of the trees, those trees have that too. And again, it speaks to climate change because out here in the extreme exactly. West, right, you know, the Western red cedars and the Sitka spruce show are showing extreme scorch and burn. Mm -hmm. um, and rather that the, uh, the Doug firs, the coastal Doug firs, you know, said, hey, what's the big deal? You know, <laughs> bring on more sun, come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we may lose trees in the next year or so because of just slow death. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we see trees uh, dying back. Um, you know, one or two summers of hot weather will, will hurt. You know, if we start getting continuous ones, then you're going to start seeing certain types of trees just completely die out. Again, right, Pat, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here, you know, today. And again, I, we, we look forward to tapping into you in the future. And please, if, in, if indeed you find of, uh, if there's other news you think that would be of, 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 of great interest for us here in the extreme west part of the state, uh, especially in contrast for what you see in the east part, do share because it, it is fascinating thinking about the variety of, of climate and soil conditions that we have to deal with across this entire state, you know. So your perspectives are are quite interesting in terms of how you know how they how they contrast and compare with where we're sitting. Yeah, and if you guys get questions, you know, uh, how you you know how to help people translate their gardening experience to your climate, let me know. Thank you so much. Okay, take care, guys. Okay. Hey, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. And it, uh, what we're going to do now is it uh, is move over to our uh, is move over to our board meeting. You all are welcome to stay and join us in this board meeting here today. So that there's no, uh, uh, there's, you know, we welcome everyone's participation. And it um, uh, our agenda, the proposed agenda we have here today is actually on the screen here. Uh, we're able to add content and um, and uh, uh, and material. Uh, for, for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the board meeting. Uh, first of all, just to, uh, just with everybody here, is there anything for the good of the order or any other comments that folks want to share um, before we jump into the formal board meeting? Uh, I do. I forgot to mention something about the garden tour. Um, we need uh, cookies for the um, hospitality table at the Valentine Garden. Um, every Every garden tour, we have cookies and, and coffee at one of the gardens, and Robin is hosting that in her garden. So if you bake cookies for it, you get one hour of volunteer time. Uh, cookies can be dropped off to her, or they can be uh, dropped off if you're dropping off your plants at the um, um, Valentine business where we are storing the plants uh, the week before the tour. Yeah. Or you can email me and I'll figure out how to get them from you. I thought you were gonna say email the cookies and I thought that'd be an interesting, yes, indeed. <laughs> well, there are email cookies, you know. <laughs> Very good. Any other comments from the, for the good of the order? Okay. With that, we will start our, our board meeting here. Um, uh, PJ, do you wanna, do you wanna take on uh, lead, uh, this, you know, to open the meeting and approve the agenda and the minutes and so forth? Or, or I'll, I'll keep on with it. I'm, Kelly, why don't you keep on? I'm having an internet issue and I just got thrown out of our meeting, just got back on. So <laughs> okay, I don't wanna good. get started and then be gone. As Very you can good. see, I'm now David Rupp. So that's okay. That's okay. It's, it's, we'll just sorry. <laughs> it's it's going to freak everybody out, you know, seeing all these rups out here. That's for sure. All these rups. Yes, yeah, the rup takeover. Yeah. Anyway, thank everyone for joining us here in the board meeting. So we have our we have a proposed agenda up here. 
Um, I tried to include comments that I heard from other folks. We've got some things. I, I know Cindy has some things to talk about here with respect to training as well as respect to the demo garden. Um, we'll give an update on the, to, on the website refresh that's underway. Um, um, uh, I have some slides here to share that Sharon has prepared relative to our treasures report. Um, we can revisit other items. Um, any amendments or edits to the agenda as proposed? And if not, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. And can we add uh, the uh, hotspot discussion? Indeed, I was going to do that before. Yeah, so at least we'll add a hotspot discussion. And Kelly, this is Cindy. I would, Please? I would, uh, I, I need to be out of here by one. So uh, if let's, you, we'll, let's you jump. want to hear from me, you might want to move me up on the agenda or we'll just uh, I'll jump right to you. Here. We'll okay. jump right to you once we get you going on the apps. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Motion to approve the agenda with the added. We're going to talk about hotspots included there. I so move. Second. I second. There you go. We have a second coming up. A lot of enthusiasm from the board here today. That's good. That's good. That's for <laughs> sure. Just, you know, hang in there, team. Hang in there. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, Hi. Very good. We have an agenda. The minutes I distributed in last week's uh, notice, this is the, the draft minutes for the June meeting. Um, any edits or con uh, connections? I, I found a misspelling in it um, that I fixed, yeah. you know. Um, motion to approve or any edits? Any other edits? If I move to approve. Thank you very much. We have a second. I'll second. We have a second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And again, I apologize for the, you know, the perfunctory nature of this, but as a corporation, this is, these are the yep. record of a corporation. And so, you know, there is going through some sort of transparency in the Robert's rules of orders. With that, let us switch quickly to Cindy so that we can have some of her items here to make sure that we have a, a full discussion from her. Okay, uh, so so mostly what I wanted to do first, Kelly, was to talk about um, talk about some of the things that we do, but we don't talk, we don't share with each other. So and and because uh, in the education we have four different uh, four different committees going on, and they're all very active, and I know that committees such as this are going on in places like Ocean Shores and Pacific County as well. But, but I just wanted to introduce the idea, the concept of sharing the things that are happening with us um, because I don't think we cover that very often. So that's all, that's all, that's what I wanted to do with, with that. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say that as far as plant clinics are concerned, uh, Garnet uh, has been doing a wonderful work with the Elma Food Banks every Monday afternoon and she and, and the folks that work with her thank you all for doing that um, so and then Karen Russo has been uh, setting up wonderful plant clinics at the dentist company and at the Saturday uh, the Sunday market I guess it was it is the Sunday market in in Aberdeen as well and so far I've gotten uh, plant clinic information from both Garnet and Karen up to the end of June about the end of June and with that, we've had 11 plant clinics and, and, and have served about 152 or so clin uh, uh, clients. So I'm sure Ocean Shores has, a, has an equivalent uh, number of, of, of good things they want to talk about for plant clinics and likewise with Pacific County. But I just want us to remember that this is the work that we do is about you know, serving the public, the plant clinics, and the and the education. So, so we should be sharing that in our meetings. So, okay. So on onward to the next item, the next committee that is uh, ho hosted by Jude, and that is about study groups. She and and Katie put study groups on every month, and that is a wonderful way to get um, continuing education by doing your own research on topics that the group agrees to and then comes back and discusses them. And they're really, it, it's really a great deal of fun. If you haven't done it, it's a wonderful way to learn something new and to, to um, kind of develop a relationship with other master gardeners. 
that you may not have, have worked with in other ways. And especially now, since we are not, um, we're not having our in-person uh, meetings. So the so that so Jude and Katie are doing a great job with that. They just finished a one on grasses, and it, it was very very uh, productive, and a lot of people enjoyed it very much. So Katie has also been leading uh, the workshops, and she finished the last one in June. Uh, boy, I don't have the date down, but you know, Katie is she she sets up the workshop. She she uh, kind of uh, pulls together the crew that's going to to present, and then puts on the workshop, and then. Uh, does her, uh, her query about how, how well did it go for you to, to the audience and such. And she's had some really good responses and the workshops this spring have, have been tailored because of COVID and what we talked about and what some of the things that you talked about with Pat, we're tailoring to, to beginner gardeners and uh, so so that was the the bulk of the kinds of workshops that Katie put on with with the crews but she actually asked had to host a couple of workshops by herself because she didn't have an awful lot of help so that's that is a that is a bone of contention but with me for me not for Katie Katie's very she can handle anything good grief we all know that about Katie but anyways it's just because she does such a good job and she has a job on on the outside so she doesn't really need to do everything so it'd be nice or if we had offered her more help for that so but the, the workshops are are done for now we usually take a hiatus during the the summer and then start again in the fall um, but we haven't done anything about thinking about that yet and now as far as now the last of our committees is the executive committee which is the committee that actually does the planning for our master gardener training and we have five members. It's Elena, uh, Mary Shane handles PR, Trish handles the mentoring element, and Jude and I handle the, the curriculum. Uh, so, so we have been working together for the last two or three months. Uh, and just, yes, just this last week, we kind of hammered out our, our schedule for the classes and such. And we might have sent a query out, like for instance, I've I've sent a query out to Sharon Coolidge Bales to see if she if she, what has her preferred time to have her her particular session. So we're actually getting things up and running there, um, but we're not far enough along to see about additional help for actual training during training, for other presenters and building a team around each session. But if you are interested in doing that, um, be sure and send me an email and I will connect with you and put you down on a list and we'll figure out how you want to, to engage uh, during training. But those are the four committees I wanted to talk to you about. They're all very active, um, except for of course workshops now that, that that's over with, but but it's a, it's a busy time of year and we don't, just do meetings. We do a lot of education and plant clinics and other things. So, so that's what I had to talk about as far as it, you have it up there as training. For me, it was all four of the, all four of the committees that fall under uh, the education director. Okay. So not, so, so if there aren't any questions, and I assume there aren't, but. Oh, wait, the, the key thing I wanted to get to is that, um, uh, as, as we get into the 2022 training uh, program, make sure that you're 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 cluing us all into um, you know the, the schedule you want us to be on, right? As we start to prepare for curriculum and advertising and so forth. Right? Yeah, we haven't really settled on that. Uh, you know what we did is we looked at, at a couple of ideas for the the timing of of when classes start and stop and such, uh, Kelly. We and and we we did essentially agree that because we're working because. Craig is working on our, our website and we want to be sure and incorporate that as a as a way for to make it easier for people to actually apply you know so we need to have well in my mind it needs to be it needs to be a, a done deal before we start throwing things onto the website and have um, yep. have that that ready for people to uh, Download an application and, and then proceed the, that part of the process for them. So that kind of puts us back a little bit. It's not a hardship. It's it's it, it works out fine, but we just kind of set it back a little bit. So we're thinking now of starting in March, okay, and going into June. So it's not really that different. 
Um, but in, in incorporating, of course, a time when there's not a, a, a session, but there'll be, uh, there'll be the home and garden show. We're counting on having that home and garden show as part of, of the overall training because we use that for uh, kind of an introduction for the trainees to get into volunteering. And it also for, it's, a, it's their first opportunity to do plant clinic with somebody like Jude or Karen. And it's, it's really a, a rich experience for, for trainees. So it's a great introduction into Master Gardener volunteering and, and then some of the other kinds of work we do as well. So too much talk on that? No, it's never too much to talk about that. Okay, uh, right, Cindy. Yes, I would. I would just like to um, uh, mention that we joined the Elmer, Elma Chamber of Commerce, which yes. allows us to use their reader board oh, yes. uh, for announcements, which might apply to your classes and and uh, okay. other other things you're doing, plant clinics in the area. They also will post on their Facebook page about our events. And um, I think add us to a, their website as well. So yeah. um, that applies to a lot of the things that, that you, you are involved with. So oh, I just wonderful. want to remind you of that again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And you're hearing about it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's really, I appreciate you connecting the dots because I hadn't done that. Thank you very much. Well, it's brand new. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the, so the I, so I'm I'm gonna go on to the demonstration garden if that's okay. Krista, do you have Can a question? Can I just yeah. Yeah. yeah? Um, when you spoke of workshops, what you oh. what I think you're speaking of is first Saturdays, which are Correct. specific to Graves Harbor County. Yes. And I was just All wondering those... if in the future we might sort of um, do a better job of picking up those that occur in Pacific County, because Pacific. we haven't done that in the past. In Pacific, Just yeah. Is that what you said? Pick up the Pacific County ones as well? Correct. Well, Chris, I'm not in charge of those. That's why you heard about the Grays Harbor, OK? But, but I, they so should all go on why, I guess I don't understand why there's, well, it doesn't matter. I, I, Chris, I, went, okay. I can I just speak as. We just, we, we just really haven't had any workshops in Pacific County. And it, uh, in fact, we just started having discussions in the last week here as to uh, when we want to pick those back up again. So it's, it's been a while, Chris, you know, so it's, uh, so, we're, you know, we're still, uh, we haven't undertaken anything because of COVID restrictions here. Then can I mention something? I, I was involved with the publicity for the last first Saturday, which was group. Those were virtual. And they were advertised in Pacific County. And uh, I think people from Pacific County were also involved in uh, present, you know, in working and presenting at it. Okay. So, it, so it did involve uh, Pacific County. <laughs> it was Zoom. Yeah, it was, there was Zoom. Yeah, right. Yeah, both the study group and, and the workshops are, are via Zoom. So, yeah, thank you, Kathleen. So Cindy talking about you know, the, the demo garden. Oh yeah, and <laughs> the demo garden, not so not such happy news. We've discovered that we we apparently have some leaks in the water system and the irrigation system. So um, I just wanted to, to let the board know that that we're gonna be looking into how to get that fixed. It can't be fixed now because we're in the middle of the growing season and we're not gonna dig up the garden to figure it out. Uh, we're going to we're going to work around it, um, but that's not a long term solution. Um, this is the irrigation system to the raised bed. So it's it's kind of the heart of the garden. So obviously we, we're missing it, <laughs> but but we have hoses. So that's how we're getting around it. Um, but it just kind of cropped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, that it looks like we have a, at least one, if not two or three serious underground leaks. So. I just wanted to let you, put you guys. Uh, are the are the leaks of a, of a sort that are they severe enough? You're concerned about um, structural damage to the adjoining the buildings on either side of the. Uh... No, no, they're they're not in, located anywhere near a building. What they, but they are running into onto the road in the, that's in the. <laughs> I mean, it's clearly running out of the garden and onto the road. 
So that's a lot of water. And who's so, paying? Who's paying? Is, is the the fairgrounds or they're paying yes, for that water then? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And then, and I don't think we, they are supposed to. I think ideally we we are supposed to be paying the utilities on on such things, but they are picking up the bill now. They're not saying anything about it, but I do plan to include them and get their ideas on how to fix it because they may know, you know, they may they may have a better fix than we do. But none of us. I don't do that kind of work. And, and then uh, most of us that can do that, that have done that kind of work, we may not, we may not want to anymore. <laughs> it's, it's hard work. So know. there's, there's yeah. no, we, we don't have a water shutoff coming to the main. We, um, we do, but, but some of the, okay, let me just put it this way. Some of the raised beds, they're all set up to work, uh, to, to irrigate um, via automatic uh, timer, okay. right? Okay. And, and so some of them work and, and function well, and some of them are on the pathway to the leaks. So, you know, I, we haven't segregated them out. Okay. And so, so and, and clearly what you're saying too, it's also convinced this is not the line coming into the garden. This is oh, our responsibility. These are underground, it's, it's, yeah, it's lines we put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyways, uh, that, I just wanted you guys to know because it, I don't know how much it would cost or anything about fixing it at this point in time, but you need to understand that there's a problem, so we're looking into it. Okay. But it's not gonna get fixed yet. So that was that's the bottom, bottom line. It'll, it'll get fixed hopefully in the fall. Okay. We'll talk about it later again, okay. so. I would, yeah. I would, I would hope, Cindy, if indeed, the, the, just given if this is an emergency and, and we're, we're, we're vast quantities of water being wasted that we would actually you know you know you have our support to bring in plumbing assistance right if you need to go find these things yeah 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 i'm, I'm turning off the the water to those particular beds that are leaking and then and then we're hand watering most of the, that kind of stuff okay uh -huh. so it, so it's not like we can't work around it but it's this is just not the time of year when we want to be digging up the garden yep. sorry if we and can work around it, well, well, and that's and that's what my plan is. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, can I make a comment on that, yeah. uh, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, apparently, the old PVC pipes going to the gardens. Yes, we have three valves, and uh, we can shut off that probably particular area if we have to. And as you said, Cindy's watering it by hand now. I was going to shut those off uh, this week, but uh, um, digging down there, we're just afraid we're going to run into a mess of old PVC pipes. And uh, we don't know if we can uh, repair the whole situation because they're probably down there a foot and a half deep right now. And uh, it's going to involve a lot of digging and a lot of labor. <laughs> Not good. Yeah. Not yeah, but but the, but we want to make sure that we have um, when we don't want to have to do it. Uh, I'm sorry. The bottom line is we don't want to have to be the people that have to do that. We we don't have the knowledge, nor do we have the the back strength anymore. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's no question that 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 plumbing can be pretty severe. And I appreciate the yeah. fact that those those to Rick's point, you know, a lot of those pipes and joints are probably pretty old. So it yeah. um, you know well, something they date back about 1996, I believe. So <laughs> yeah, fairly old. Back when you and I had hair, Rick, that's for sure. Yeah, a little. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> hey, thanks much, Cindy, for the update. Anything else? Thank you. No, that's it. Thank you for listening. Very good. Hey, so just backing up here a little bit. Um, I see uh, Terry stepped away from her desk. I want to. I want to make sure that she's covered everything we need to cover on the on the garden tour. Um, real quick, um, Sharon, on the treasures report, I put up your balance sheet and your your P and L. Um, you can see from the balance sheet that's being shared right here is that we're still flush with cash, you know, yeah. to, to our knowledge is that uh, Sharon has and, and Rick have not planned that Bermuda trip, you know, now that COVID restrictions are away, um, you know, it, uh, so we'll have to, we'll, we'll keep watching that bank balance to make sure that Sharon is not exploiting, um, yeah. you know, her, her, her to, you know, that our cash, uh, which is, which is earning, of course, you know, phenomenal interest rate, you know, at the, uh, yes, know, the CD uh, has earned absolutely nothing for the full year so far, which, you know, it's in the money market rather than the CDs. So I think you probably need to, well, I'm not even sure it's time yet to put it back into CDs because they were basically not paying anything. Yeah. 
And then on the, uh, I just did a real quick extract on the P&L on our profit and loss statement for the year. And, uh, and it, it is pretty amazing that you can see that even to date, we're still, a, we're still holding our nose above water here, $1, nearly $1,000 above water for, that, uh, for the whole year here. Um, in it, uh, in overall, and, and and of course, the big part of that was the huge success of the uh, of the May plant yeah. sale. That made a huge difference. Yeah. Um, any other comments, Sharon, on the treasures report for the year, or any comments from anyone, rather relative to uh, money? Again, a shout out to Karen, uh, Sharon, and Renee for their 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 management of this. Um, this it's a big deal to uh, to manage funds in a public corporation and it uh, we are very fortunate to have this uh, this thoughtful care of our finances can i just say as an old vet thank you thank you sharon and renee you're doing a fabulous job i i know about treasuries and other organizations and you just are top notch oh, thank well, you the quickbooks makes it a lot easier than it could be <laughs> yeah if anyone wants the full, um, you know, the, the full reports and so forth, um, you know, um, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. There's, there's buckets and buckets of information, right, that, uh, that Sharon can immerse you with here. Hey, Terry, I see you're back. Any other comments on the, on the sale? And in fact, I, I know Shashila's put a comment in here in terms of um, just how many tickets are available to sale, uh, for sale, et cetera. Um, uh, I know that was at uh, how many tickets are available for sale overall was a comment that Shashila put in the, in the chat. Our, um, um, well, I'm not sure because we pulled, we pulled tickets out for um, docents and for homeowners, but 